There we go. <laughs> okay, so thank you very much, Stefano, for coming today to give this talk about a metapopulation model in which patches have memory. We're all looking forward to it. So the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Gyuri. Thank you for organizing this. As I was saying, it's quite rare to be speaking to an audience of theoretical ecologists. And you talk to ecologists, you talk to mathematicians, but this is something different. So I try to have a short talk and there will be some sort of methodological aspects. And the problem I'm going to talk about is actually fairly old. I think that this model arose in conversation with Jacob Grigli, maybe in late 2016, early 2017. And we couldn't really like make much progress. And over the years, I bothered a bunch of people that are listed here, including Theo that I've seen, like is connected, Carlos, Abby, Podinia. But like for today's result, my partner in crime is Zach Miller, who's also connected, so maybe can answer some of the questions. And, and, and so like we made some progress very recently. In fact, like when I accepted to give the talk and I decided to speak about this problem, uh, we, we didn't even have like a half-baked uh, project. <laughs> now we do, so, so I'm very happy that we made progress at the last, at the 11th hour. And, this problem starts with the work of Levins, uh, of like this uh, paper from 1969, in fact, like this paper that I have here in front of me. Yeah. And, and uh, this is work that the, uh, Richard Levins did when he was actually here at the University of Chicago. Here you can see a picture of him that is in the Lily room downstairs. And, and uh, Richard Levins, you know, was a fantastic scientist, theoretician, uh, evolutionary biologist, but also a farmer and a revolutionary. Uh, and so this problem like, that he's studying is actually pitched as some, some sort of like a biological pest control uh, project, but he proposes this very simple model of a metapopulation, we, which is represented here. So the idea is that we have a, a bunch of like patches of suitable habitats, imagine like infinitely many of them. And, and these patches can be in two states. Uh, they could be occupied, which here is the, just like the, the green color here. Right, occupied or empty, which would be like the, 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 the white color. And, and the idea is to, to track the proportion of patches that are occupied at any point in time, and we call this proportion X. And conversely, we could track like the number of patches or the proportion of patches that are empty, which I call pi. And, and there's basically two processes that contribute to the dynamics. One is colonization, so empty patches turn uh, occupied. And the converse is extinction, like an occupied patch goes uh, 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 empty. Uh, and so basically we have only two parameters, a rate that I call here M, which is like the extinction rate. So that's like the, the way to turn like occupied patches into empty patches. And then the colonization. And you can see here that what we have is really mass action. So what we're implicitly assuming is that these patches are very many and that like uh, each uh, individuals from each patch can dis disperse to any other patch with the same uh, rate. Uh, and so like you can write the model like this. Typically it's written actually in a slightly different way. Here I, I'm writing both equations for x and phi just because I need them later. But what you can see is that these, uh, you know, because these are proportional, they must sum to one. And therefore like the, the, the rates must sum to zero, which means that now we can write the equation for x by substituting to phi one minus x. And then with some massaging, we can see that this is basically the equation for a logistic growth, right? So, so this connects with a famous model in, in theoretical ecology. And we know that this is gonna be a very simple dynamics that will just go to some equilibrium as long as these parameters you know, are, are positive. If of course, like the colonization rate has to be larger than the mortality rate, and then we have a globally stable equilibrium that, that tells us how many patches would be occupied at any point in time. And so this is like 1969. This model has been extended in a number of ways and is actually fairly connected with other models that we study as ecologists and evolutionary biologists. For example, an SIS model in which now patches are people and uh, occupied means infected uh, and extinct means recovers. So we can write these a couple equation for the proportion of susceptible and the proportion of infected in the population. And you can see that they have the same form. And of course, they have the same uh, solution. Right? So there is really this parallel. And I'm trying to keep this parallel going when I complicate the model. 
as I said, this is work from, from uh, back in the day. A, a, and there's been two main directions, as I see it, to extend this model. One of them is, of course, to remove the condition everybody is connected with everybody with the same rate. And so here, what we're thinking is there is some sort of dispersal matrix that determines the rates at which individuals from a certain patch can colonize a different patch. And so this dispersal matrix, we, 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 we can represent it as some sort of like kernel, right, of dispersal that depends maybe on the distance between the patches, maybe on the matrix that is in between like these two patches, whether it's easy to traverse or not for, for animals or, or for plants. And, and moreover, we could say not all patches are created equal. We have some sort of value for each patch. And this is exactly what Hansky and Novaskainen did in this beautiful paper in Nature in 2000, the metapopulation capacity of a fragmented landscape. And what they show, which I find especially interesting because I'm always for linear algebra, is that basically the role of the parameter P that we had before the colonization rate is now played by an eigenvalue of M or a function of the eigenvalue of a function of M. And this tells me like whether colonization is sufficiently large to offset the mortality like the extinction. To keep like uh, uh, the parallel with, with the SIS model, you find this paper by, by Mike et al. In, 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 after a number of years, actually, like in 2008, this is called virus spread in, in networks. And what they end up writing is exactly the same model, but now in the context of an SIS uh, 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 dynamics. And in fact, they find the same exact solution, right? That these eigenvalues, what the term is what happens. And actually, I worked on this uh, uh, with, with the Yuri and with Jacopo in, in this paper where we asked ourselves, what happens if I throw like these patches at random in a space that is d-dimensional? And it turns out that with some random matrix theory, you can actually find a very nice solution for that. Okay, so this is one main direction, which is like, let's include some realism in the distance between the patches, in the patches value and whatnot. The second, of course, is to consider that these patches may be occupied by several species and the several species could be interacting with each other. So now each patch potentially can contain an entire ecological community, imagine a food web or like a set of competitors or what else. And now the colonization depends on the state of the patch. For example, a herbivore can colonize a patch only if the plant is already present. And these make for fairly complicated models. They can also be connected with the other idea of having like patches dispersed like in a landscape. And recently, actually, I just read this like in the past couple of weeks, there was a beautiful review by Gross et al. in Philosophical Transaction, where they actually review like what is that we're trying to do? What are the main obstacles to developing like a full theory for this type of case? In the realm of, uh, in fact, like this picture is taken from that paper, this beautiful picture. In the, in the realm of like infectious diseases, now what we're thinking is co-infection, right? Like that the same individual could be infected by multiple pathogens at the same time, and these pathogens would be interacting with each other. A third way to think about this problem, which is a way that I really like, is to look at this picture. This is like a picture of a tropical rainforest. And, and what you can see from this picture is that there's no <laughs> space, right? Like everything is occupied by trees. And, and, and so like if you were to draw like a square of this picture, count the number of trees, you would have the same number of trees for every square pretty much. And, and so what you could think is like each patch is like the, the place where I can fit one tree, right? And now what we have are some sort of zero sum dynamics in which like uh, trees die. And you can see that in this picture, there are a bunch of trees that are dead, like here, for example, or here. And now once uh, one of these patches become empty, it can get colonized by other uh, seedlings from other species. And an especially fun uh, case to study in this case would be that of like species of trees that form some sort of rock, paper, scissor, where A can displace B, B can displace A, 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 A you know, A displaces B, B displaces C, C displaces A. A and that's something I studied with Jonathan like in 2011. And this model is very simple, but, but what it's nice is that can be extended in a number of ways. For example, what if I include like interactions between three different plants at a time rather than two? Or, or what if I include 
the intraspecific variation, which we did like with Jacopo and with Dan uh, respectively. And, and what is interesting in both cases, what we find is a strong stabilization. Okay, so that's uh, just another way to think about these models as some generic zero sum dynamics. And so today I would like to extend in a different direction, which is one in which patches have some feature that we will call some sort of memory. And the idea is basically that the rate at which you colonize a patch depends on who was there before you. And especially we're thinking what happens where you're trying to colonize a patch that was freed by a conspecific, by individuals of your same species. And now there's two ways to think about that, which you could think of as the glass being half full or half empty. The glass is half full in the sense that if some conspecific were there before you, then there must be some sort of suitable environmental condition for growth, because otherwise you wouldn't have like colonization in the first place. And then if you're thinking, for example, I don't know, of legumes or other like plants, we know now that these are like the growth and the establishment of plants is very much influenced by say microbiomes. So maybe you already have like a, a, a suitable bacteria community. And so you should be favored in your growth. Or similarly, you could have other symbionts, mutualists that are around just because they, you had the conspecific before. Of course, the, there's the converse that is, why did the conspecific go extinct? And, and this could be because it suffered from competition from uh, conspecifics that are nearby, and these would be perfect competitors. Or similarly to the problem of microbiome or symbionts, we could have predators or parasites that are present or seed consumers. Right? And this basically connects with the jensen connell hypothesis that is one of the ways we try to explain a diversity of trees in the tropics, which basically boils down to saying it is true that the apple does not far, fall far from the tree, but on the other end, it's much less likely to germinate close to the tree because there are all these seed predators and parasites and whatnot. If we want to turn this idea of memory into an SIS model, then what we would be speaking of is some sort of cross immunity, right? Like depending on which pathogens did you experience before, now it's much more likely or less likely that I can enter as a new pathogen. All right, so just the picture is almost like the one that we had before. It's slightly more complicated in the sense that now we have multiple species, which here are multiple colors. And then each patch can be in n different states, right? Uh, as empty and n different states as a field. So, so like here I have like light colors for an empty patch that used to be blue and then a darker color for, for a patch that is occupied by species blue. And again, we have just two types uh, of uh, parameters. We have extinction rates, right? That could be species specific. This is the rate at which like the species blue goes extinct. And then we have colonizations, which now would be some sort of a metric right because we have to determine like the colonization for every pair and especially we're interested in what is the colonization for con specific right that would be the diagonal of these metrics versus hyper specific which would be the off diagonal pairs okay so with this uh, in mind we can write the model and the model looks like this so let's start maybe from the top left, right? So we have XI is like the proportion of patches occupied by species I, and these patches become empty with a rate MI. And then each XI can try to colonize empty patches of type J with a certain rate PIJ, and I'm summing over all the possible uh, ways to, to turn a patch that used to be empty into a field patch by species I. And then we have the converse, right? Now we write the equation for phi of I, which would be the empty patches that have memory of i and and of course like this first term just comes from the other equation exactly as an sis model but now we have like a negative term that depends on the density of these empty patches i of type i and then on the field patches of all the other species it's convenient to actually write this in in vector form right so d of x would be just a diagonal matrix with x on the diagonal and it's convenient because you can see that this first equation looks exactly like a logical Terra model. And then the second equation is slightly different, right? Because what we have here is like Xi. If we had like phi of i here, then what we would have is really a MacArthur like consumer resource model, which is interesting because we know that then any feasible equilibrium would be stable. 
It, so the whole complication is the fact that these really depend on the state of the other uh, set of equations, right? So, so we can write it like this, but we cannot really take d of p in front. And so from this first equation in matrix form, you can see that it's very easy to see what will be the equilibrium of phi, right, in this case, right? Because we have to have p times phi has to be equal to n, and therefore we have exactly like a lot of double terra, right? That phi would be the inverse of p times n, and it's gonna be feasible when, when all these numbers are positive. And in fact, if we want to have also some x, is they better sum to less than one, right? Because they cannot fill like the whole space. And then to, to find x, what we are left with is some sort of matrix here, right? That is this m minus diagonal of p star p transpose. And you can see that x has to be an eigenvector of this matrix with eigenvalue of zero associated with it, right? So, so these are like the, the, the equations. The behavior of the model can be fairly complex. So just have like a few examples here at the bottom. So here dashed line means like the density of the empty patches of type, for example, pink. And then like the solid line would be the, the proportion of occupied patches in this case, for example, of species blue. And so here is a case in which all species go extinct. And then we end up with empty patches of different types that sum to one. And in these two cases, we have complicated dynamics at the beginning and then maybe it seems like that the red species is taking over but eventually dies and then blue takes over and there's a single species. And here, a similar initial like transit dynamics and then we end up with species red. Interestingly enough, these two uh, simulations are from exactly the same parameterization, just different initial conditions. So you can see that there's some sort of like space for historical contingencies or effect of initial conditions. Right, in general, studying this whole model in its full glory, it's quite hard. That's why, you know, uh, we've been looking at this for several years. And, and recently what we decided is just to study like the simplest possible model and try to take it from there and, and, and see whether we can make some progress. And the simplest model that you can think of is one in which like the metrics, well, first of all, for, like all the uh, extinction rates are the same and we can set them without loss of generality to one. And then the matrix P, right, that determines like colonization is made only of two numbers. One number on the diagonal and one number on the off-diagonal. Okay, so you basically have only differentiation between patches that were occupied by conspecifics and patches that were uh, occupied by heterospecific, but in which case you don't really care of which were the heterospecifics. And then this parameterization that I choose here, you know, like you can imagine uh, there's some sort of constant that is positive beta. And this is like the baseline uh, colonization rate for all the patches. And then your conspecific part of the matrix is modified by this alpha. So you can imagine alpha is positive means you're more likely than heterospecific to colonize your own empty patches. And alpha negative would be the converse. You're less likely to colonize your own empty patches. And they just put like n alpha here rather than just alpha because it's convenient because then the equilibrium for phi star, right, for the um, empty patches turns out just to be one over n times alpha plus beta where n is the number of species in the system. And then all species must have exactly the same uh, equilibrium because you can see that this matrix is the same up to relabeling. And, and therefore also all the axis must be the same. And in fact, they must be one over n minus like phi of i, right? And if you do the calculation, you get alpha plus beta minus one, which means what? That this system is feasible if alpha plus beta is greater than one and it's not feasible otherwise, uh, like coexistence of all the species and all the empty patches. And in fact, if you choose like alpha plus beta equals to two, then what you get is that all the, the species and all the empty patches will have the same equilibrium, which will be just one over two n. Right, so, so on the left, we have dynamics for two of these cases in which alpha plus beta sum to two. So we can choose, for example, alpha equals to one and beta equals to one here. And what you see is that there must be an equilibrium that is gonna be just like one over, in this case, eight, but it's unstable, right? Whenever I start the dynamics, they, you, you get just like a single a species taking over and who takes over depends on the initial conditions. And then I choose here beta is equal to three, alpha is equal to minus one. And what you observe is stability, right? They, they go to this equilibrium 
of one eighth each. And in fact, you can do many, many, many simulations and you can change these parameters. And what you find is that basically every time alpha is negative and the equilibrium is feasible, you have like stability irrespective of initial conditions. And then on the converse, when alpha is positive, you have a feasible equilibrium, but irrespective of the initial conditions, you always end up with a single species taking over, right? Which, which suggests what? Uh, global stability, right? That we're, what we would like to show is that when uh, alpha is negative, this system will always go to the equilibrium. And when uh, alpha is positive, it will always move away from the equilibrium. And so this would really be a job for, for what? For, for the Apono functions, right? So, so ideally, to prove that this is the case, what we would like to do is to use this uh, very, very bright idea that Alexander Lyapunov proposed in 1892, which has some sort of magic, right? But just like to review what we're trying to accomplish, right? We have a system of differential equations which we cannot really solve, and we're tracking the dynamics as x of t, and these will be dynamics in the n-dimensional space, right, Rn. So what we would like to do is to write a function that you can think of it as a, some sort of summary statistics of the state of the system, right? This V function that maps this uh, n-dimensional space into like R, into just like one number. And it has like basically two main features. First of all, we would like this V to be positive for all the reasonable X that we can choose. It should be also zero at the equilibrium, right? So we have these two conditions on what is V, so V is always positive besides at the equilibrium where it's zero. And then most importantly, we would like the derivative with respect to time of V to be negative. So, so now we have a quantity that is always positive, it's always declining through time, and therefore it will reach eventually zero, which is what the equilibrium. So in this case, a X is theta. Right? So this is the beautiful idea by Lyapunov. Unfortunately, the problem remains of how do we choose this V? And I like this quote from, from Steve Strogatz in this book, Nonlinear Dynamics and Chaos, that says, unfortunately, there is no systematic way to construct Lyapunov functions. Divine inspiration is usually required. And believe it or not, I am really lacking in divine inspiration. I found out the hard way that I really don't have a shred of divine inspiration in my body. And so what can we do when we don't have divine inspiration? That's like a question that I would like to address. Just like to, to step back one second, what we can think is, do we have good candidate Lyapunov functions? And for generalized log Volterra model, we have a fantastic candidate Lyapunov function that you can trace back actually to Volterra's work, but was really like proposed in this formulation that I'm gonna show you today by Go in 1990. So it's almost as old as I am. And, and so like, let's think one second about Lotka Volterra. So we have like a, a bunch of species that we track and these are like embedded in the Z vector. And this is just like the Lotka Volterra. We have a vector of growth rates. Here are, we have a matrix of interactions A. And then if there is a feasible equilibrium, because otherwise what are we doing, then this should be the solution of, of this equation, right? So we can take the negative of like the inverse of A multiplied by R, and this should be always greater than zero. And now if you just put A on the other side, what you find is like that R must be minus A Z star. And so you can rewrite this equation by saying, well, it's going to be diagonal of Z, A, Z that we had before, but now we have minus Z star that it's like my R. And so you can write this in compact form and saying diagonal of Z, a delta z, where these delta z are just like the deviations from this equilibrium. Now, in this form, it's very easy to write the equations for the logarithm of z. How does that change in time? And what you would just need to do is to divide each equation by the corresponding z. And so what you find is a delta z. Here. OK, so with this at hand, we can write this candidate, the Apono function, which is written in this way. Right, so it's going to be z of i minus its value at equilibrium minus its value at equilibrium times the log of the ratio between the, the variable z i and its equilibrium value. So you can see that the part inside the parentheses here, it's always positive or zero. And it's going to be zero at equilibrium, which means what? That if I can choose some sort of suitable constants here to put in front c i that are positive, then this function b will always be positive. 
and we know it's zero at equilibrium. Now, what remains to be shown is that these functions should also decrease through time, right? So, so, so what, what we would like to do is to take the derivative with respect to time, right, which would be zi dot, like the derivative with respect to time of zi, minus the equilibrium value times the equation for the logarithm in time. And it's actually convenient to write this in matrix form because now you can see what's going on, right? So we have diagonal of z, a delta z, and here we have minus diagonal of z star, a delta z. But now you can couple z and delta z here, right? So we get c transpose, diagonal of delta z, a delta z. C transpose we can write as one transpose d of c, but then we have the product of two diagonal matrices, they commute, so we can swap these two. And now we multiply one transpose by delta z, so we end up with this formulation, right? Delta z transpose, diagonal of c, a delta z. And now one thing that you, you can notice is that we're summing across all the elements of this matrix, a d, c, a. a. And so only the symmetric part of this matrix will matter. Right, because we, we're going to have a term with ij and then the other term with ji. So you can take the symmetric part of this matrix, call it m, and now we're left with this very simple equation, which you might recognize because it's really like an equation that we see all the time when we're thinking of negative definite matrices. Right? So if m is negative definite, then we know that this quantity must be lower or equal than zero. And in fact, if this matrix has only uh, negative eigenvalues, it's going to be zero only if delta z is zero, right? Which is what? The equilibrium. So this whole thing boils down to, can I find numbers, ci constants, such that this matrix n is negative definite? If so, my equilibrium is stable. And so that's how you actually uh, uh, prove like stability, global stability in many cases of Lotka Volterra. And in fact, like these metrics like dc of a, right? This will require what? A has to be stable in the sense that it has to have negative eigenvalues. And you can show that if this matrix is negative definite M, then you can multiply you know, A by any quantity that is positive. This is also stable, right? This is called the upon of diagonal stability. And it's used a lot in feasibility and other uh, issues. All right. The problem that we have is our model is not Claude Cavalterra, so I cannot really use this equation as it is. But I can turn my model into a Lotka Volterra model by adding some new equations, some ghost uh, you know, equations. And in practice, what I can do is very easy. Like I can just add a bunch of equations, in fact, n of them, that define just like the ratio between the filled patches and the empty patches at any point in time. Right? So let's call this R of i. So now we, we, we went from two n equations to three n equations, which sounds like a terrible idea, but trust me, this will, will, will solve uh, our problem. So we want to put this in some sort of Lotka Volterra form. The first equation is already Lotka Volterra form, meaning there is like the, the variable in front, xi here, there is a growth rate, in this case it's negative, and then there are linear part with the other species or the other equations. Phi of i, which is not in, in Lotka Volterra form, we can just like divide this term by phi of i, put it inside, recognize that this is now my ri, and so now we have it in Lotka Volterra form. And finally, we have to add the new equations for r of i, which you can calculate, and then sure enough, they form some sort of generalized Lotka Volterra model. With this, we can basically just form a new vector of three n variables, which are just like the stack x, phi, and r. And now this model is in generalized Lotka Volterra form. Right? So we, can, we have some sort of growth rates, lambda will be minus m, a bunch of zeros, and then minus m again. And then we can write it like this. The, the uh, interaction matrix for our Lotka Volterra system is very simple, right? We will have p here minus three, p transpose, it's gonna be the effect of like phi on, on, uh, on x. A and then here we have like the diagonal of m twice, one with a positive sign, one with a negative sign, and here we get again, p transpose. Okay, so in this form, what we could say is like, now I take some sort of matrix of constants that I call gamma here, and then if I can find something for which v dot is going to be always negative and these are a constants and they're positive constants then 
I, I prove like the stability of, of my problem. What is very interesting is that in this case, you, it's fairly simple to turn this model into a general slot travel theta, but in fact, you can turn any polynomial system of differential equations or even quasi polynomial system, meaning like there could be square roots or like fractionary powers or things like that, into a typically much larger a general slot travel theta system. So the, the the downside is now we have many more equations, but the upside is that we know this model very well, so we can do a lot of things with general slot travel theta, which we cannot do any, uh, otherwise. All right, so let's do this. But then we find immediately another stumbling block, which is I cannot find these uh, uh, constants, gamma, such that these uh, matrix M is negative there. Okay, so that would be the end of the road, unless you realize that I don't really care for M to be actually negative definite. What I care about is that M should act or behave like a negative definite matrix for the perturbations that I care about. And the perturbations that I care about are admissible perturbations. So, so let's think one second about this admissible perturbation. In our system, we have to have that the sum of all the empty patches and filled patches must sum to one, right? So we're in the simplex in the n simplex uh, with these dynamics, which then means that if I look at the deviation from the equilibrium, they must sum to zero, okay? So, so that already, like we're saying, well, we can have two n numbers, we can actually have two n minus one because the last one is given. We only have two n minus one degrees of freedom because they have to sum to zero. And similarly, when I think of the perturbations of the ratio, right, like the perturbation of the new variables that I introduce, these are also set by the perturbations of the other species, right, or of the other equations. So really, even though I write three n numbers, I only have two n minus one degrees of freedom, okay? So that can help us like uh, uh, solve this model because for, for the simplest model that I shown you, you can choose like positive numbers, in fact, ones for the first two n equations. And then for the remaining equations, you choose like the equilibrium of phi star divided by alpha with a negative uh, uh, sign in front, which means that these gamma will be all positive numbers only when alpha is lower than zero, which we know is the condition for, for stability from simulations. And then you just write down like this V dot explicitly, and then uh, you can see, for example, that these part were, were just like the sum of all the perturbation, which we know is zero, so we can get rid of it. And then here we have a term that we can recognize as being exactly like Ri multiplied by phi of i. And so then we get a quadratic form. This part is always uh, negative when alpha is lower than zero. This part is always positive when alpha is greater than zero. And therefore, if we have that whenever alpha is, greater, is lower than zero and equilibrium is feasible, then the equilibrium is stable. Right, so that's one way to go about proving global stability, even for cases in which you don't have divine inspiration to find this equation. And, and this is how it looks when you're doing the simulation. So I showed you like these two top cases before. And so in one case, we have like that our Lyapunov function does what it should be doing, which is always growing in time up to like the extinction of all the species but one. And then in the case of alpha negative, it always decreases and then it reaches zero at equilibrium. Right, so that's, that's what we have. And then using the same type of technique, right? It, now this is work in progress really, right? You, you can try to complicate the model more and more, but for the simplest model, we just have like the, the condition for stability is feasible equilibrium alpha lower than zero, which you can translate into what? The colonization rate for conspecifics is lower than that for heterospecific. So, so it's really like more the jansen connell hypothesis than not like the uh, happy, you know, like case in which you find like the, the patch already suitable for you. And then you can use the same approach to prove, for example, like a two species, P symmetric, identical M, which is basically the case that we already had, a, a greater than two a, N, a identical M and then you can go down the list. So here like a green check mark means we're, we're finished with this. <laughs> Orange means we have some special cases or local stability and red, we're still working on it. 
But based on all these simulations and, and on the derivations that we have, we can actually make a fairly strong uh, conjecture, which is supported by uh, these simplest cases and these extensive numerical simulations, but it's not really like perfectly set yet. But the idea is that take any metric P that is symmetric, right? So, so where the colonization rates are symmetric uh, between any two species, then we believe that any feasible equilibrium is globally stable, provided that P has a single positive eigenvalue. So P is a symmetric matrix, we'll have only real eigenvalues. Imagine one of them has to be positive, all the other ones are negative, so zero. A, con a necessary condition for this to happen is very similar to the condition that we have here, right? So we have to have Pij must be greater than at least the minimum between Ii and Jj. Okay, so it, again, like it, it goes towards like the Jensen a cardinal hypothesis. Of course, then you can think of very many like parameterizations that would be fun to do. And I would not be me if I didn't try a rock, paper, scissor parameterization in which imagine like that A can only colonize B, B can only colonize C, and C can only colonize A, right? So in the simplest model, like this would lead to neutral oscillations. And then you can choose, for example, all the mortality rates or extinction rates to be the same such that then the equilibrium is one six. But look at this, the dynamics now are stable, right? And in fact, you can write the Lyapunov function that decreases through time. So, so this is just one case of like something that you can think of as a fun a parameterization for this model. Other ones would be, for example, some sort of idea of a succession, right? Where, where we have like species coming in and they can only colonize the next stage of the succession or other things like that. We can extend this model. Uh, in many ways, like I think one that is worth studying is a model in which we have memory loss, right? So imagine that we have like a patch that remembers who was there before for a certain time and then forgets. Then it becomes a white, uh, you know, like patch in, in the notation that we had before. So now we have uh, uh, different processes, right? We can turn these, uh, these patches like light color by going from dark color extinction but then we can turn from light color to white with this memory loss. In the context of SIS model would be what? Waning immunity, right? Like the, the immunity does not last uh, forever. Of course, now you could say memory two model, right? Where you remember the last series of patches that, that uh, what, what were the occupants of these patches and, and, and whatnot. Of course, it becomes a little more complicated. As I tried to show you, <laughs> it's already uh, difficult as it is. But this is like one of the directions we're taking. And so just like to summarize, we, we have a, a very simple model for, for patches with memory. It reduces, of course, to Levin's model when we have a single species. It's very similar to the MacArthur consumer resource model. It has some sort of like rich enough and interesting behavior. And then we found something uh, interesting in that when your colonization rate for patches that were previously occupied by conspecific is lower than that for heterospecific, then we have some sort of strong stabilization going on. And this can be seen as some multi-strain SIS model in which we have cross immunity, right? So imagine that I have zero probability or zero rate of colonizing the previously occupied patches by my same kind, and then I have low probability of occupying this other strain because they're similar to my own strain. And then we can include like loss of memory and we can do all sorts of other uh, work. So, so that's all, all I had for, for today. Like what I wanted just to say is that I'm looking for a postdoc and I'm developing a new class on theoretical ecology. So uh, maybe some of you would like to discuss this like privately or, in, or during the discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much, Stefano. So if you have any questions, just uh, raise your hand in the, uh, uh, in the participant bar and uh, go ahead. Yes, Raul. Uh, hi, Stefano. Um, thanks so much. It was a very cool talk. Um, my question was about um, as you look at like future extensions to, uh, future extensions to the model, um, when you said about like cross immunity, uh, would it be possible to at some point incorporate kind of uh, cross immunity as an antigenic landscape kind of, or let's say like instead of just like a, a matrix where you have, you know, like a two by two, you have like two interactions or something. If you have, 
if you have if you have like a kind of a landscape of interactions where maybe they follow like the um, even if it's you have multiple levels of cross of immunity, they, there's like you can map you have like a simple function that would um, map it. I, I'm not sure if what I'm asking makes sense, but sort of would it be easy to sort of incorporate an antigenic landscape into the cross immunity that you have in your model right now? Yeah, I think so. Actually, that's a good question. And there there is a, like a, a simple, like almost trivial way to do this is imagine that now you have a, a, some sort of like feature, right, of say the virus. A, and imagine that you're forming a matrix with all the features a, and then the virus, right? And then you're taking what, like, uh, let's call this matrix, I don't know, A. And then you're saying P is, for example, like B transpose B, right? So, so then you have similarity in features in the virus mapping to cross immunity, right? A, and then viruses that have nothing in common, they provide no cross immunity. So, so in that case, you could really uh, turn like these uh, rates to something that you could potentially measure, right? Like, uh, or, or, or traits of, of the virus. Thanks. Yes, do we have other questions? Yeah, to, follow up, to follow up on that, because it's very similar to something we have been thinking with David Alonso and Armand Diagat, who is here. And uh, the trick is that, of course, you know, the multi-strain models have tried to do this, right? And, and it's an enormous literature that gets into extremely difficult things depending on what do you do about immunity, because there is an enormous combinatoric space. So interestingly, uh, David had converged on, okay, let's start by this very, let's call it short memory, which is the memory of the last infection. Yeah, which, and the question we had was like, how much would you learn from that for the cases where, you know, in fact, there is a historical memory. And, and when, so there is the question that Raul just mentioned of the landscape, which is multiple traits, that's it, that is nice, plus the evolution. And then you have the, um, the very interesting question. In reality, for the cross immunity, you tend to be influenced by the history early in life. So it's almost the opposite than the, than the recent. Right. The so, first rather than the so last. This is a fascinating problem because all the efforts to do the multi strain models, of course, we have a lot of interesting computational res uh, results that map to Janssen Kono in interesting ways, conceptually, right? But, and have to do deeply, not just with pathogens, but with competition or interactions of multi-trait communities, right? So, and I think one can go into this more evolutionary sense also that uh, is treated in the strain dynamics, but the trick is this history, right? The history yeah. and what do you do about the history? I, I think like this is exactly, this is a very strange SIS model in which you remember only the last, <laughs> you know, bug that you got. You could have a model in which you remember only the first. It would look fairly similar. Uh, and I think that that can be done. It, when you get like to the history of how many infections and you're trying to keep track of all of them, this type of approach will blow up because, you know, then you have this kind of combinatorial explosion. And also then it's very difficult to think of like the growth rates, like with respect, like there are some time scales, right? Imagine at which, uh, what is your lifespan and how many bugs can you get before you die, right? If you can only get one, then remembering the last is sufficient, right? But if you are exposed to several, several, several diseases during your lifetime, then it becomes more important to have like longer memory. So, so then it, it is also a matter of like the time scales. Thank you. Yeah, Theo. Uh, yeah, thanks for the interesting talk. I'm struck by how direct the analogy I think is to consumer resource models, and I was wondering if, you know, maybe you try just writing down the actual Jacobian and having block diagonal rules, and then doing like Stacy Butler, James O'Dwyer type style. Yes. So, so we can prove like positive semi for, for, for the Jacobian. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so you can do that. Like, it turns out not to be super simple, right? So, so it is a little more involved, actually, than, than what I showed here. Like, to do the local stability for, say, generic symmetric T and all identical M's. 
but we have that derivation and you can see that this is going to be always locally stable which is good like for for the parameterization that we care about but yeah but we, we wanted just to, to, to try to like push like the envelope and see whether we can get like global stability using these other techniques. But, but that's a very, very good point. So can you do the multi-stability case with those kind of calculations? So the, the problem is like this thing as it stands, it will have only a single uh, uh, equilibrium, right? That, the, that can be feasible, a maximum of one. Then, if not, what I believe it's going to happen is that some sort of the boundary equilibrium will be uh, feasible. I, I think this is very similar to, to consumer resource, right? Like, or, or if you think to logical Volterra with some sort of symmetric matrix of interactions. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah, Rafael? Hi, uh, can you hear me? Sure. Yeah, okay. So, um, you, so this is an interesting result, and you showed it for a case where there's only a distinction between cost specifics and heterospecifics. I wonder if there's also a simple model you can write where uh, the, each uh, term in the matrix has to do with some kind of uh, trait difference between species. So you put the species on an axis, right, and you come up with some simple model of probability of invading a patch that was occupied by a different species based on the trait of that species, right? And if you can arrive at similar general results of uh, coexistence with uh, that slightly more complicated model. Yes, I think like you, you could, like when we're thinking of like the simplest model, right, it, it is, um, you know, like where we have just like beta and then something different on the diagonal, you could think of, I have some sort of rank one matrix instead of having beta. Right, that would be how much do I overlap, or what is my distance between the one trait that I have? Right, that would give you a rank one matrix. Of course, to make this work, right, to have some sort of equilibrium, then you have to have like p of full rank, right? So, so then you have to say, but there's something special to con specifics, right? So I share one trait with everybody else, right? And my strength of like competition or colonization depends on that. But then, a uh, but, but then you have to have some special rule for conspecifics, right? There are some other traits they only share with my conspecific and that is needed to have some sort of feasible equilibrium. But yeah, I, I, I agree 100%. That, that's exactly one way to, to, to write this model for many species without having to resort to parameterizing each and every growth rate, say, or para, um, colonization rate, say, at random or in another way. Yeah, it's like introducing some sort of structure to this matrix, right? Which is what is interesting. But but right now, what I'm concerned with is like write down very generic uh, uh, conditions that then can be satisfied or not by any model that you can come up with for for this matrix P, uh, and then they're easy enough to check. Yeah. Yeah, I think Thierry and I have a have a paper that is slightly related to this this idea that you can have your niche differentiation between different species, but when it comes to cost specifics, you need to have an extra kick. Uh, well, exactly. Then, then, yeah, intuitively you get coexistence yeah, there, but I think it will be. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thanks. I think uh, Mercedes commented on that on in the chat as well that you can check. But thanks. And Steve, if that was all. Okay. Hi, Stefano. Thank you for that talk. That was really neat. Hey. Um, uh, I want to go get back to those forest trees you showed us. Um, sure. There's, there's, there's this, um, been this long running debate, right? Jansen Connell and, right, about, I guess there's no debate about whether it's real or not, but there's this ongoing, for decades, there's been this argument about whether or not it's actually important, whether it can actually explain high diversity. And it strikes me that your model would be a great one for looking at that question. Because that's not just about, say, the existence of an equilibrium, but how quickly you go to it, how strong is the attraction. Have you thought about that? Do you have any results about, about so, that? Most of the results they showed you like were, were derived in the last week. So, so like, the answer, <laughs> okay. the answer to, to most okay. of the questions, I don't know. Okay. I feel that like uh, what like the literature on Jensen Connell really concentrated upon is like this idea of like a distance and trying to find a function of like what is the probability of germination with respect to the distance, right? So here is more of a qualitative take on Jensen right. Connell. 
And it's something that even in English, like I hate when this happens, right? But there are some models that even in English make sense, right? Like if you're less likely to colonize your own empty patches than other people's, right? So when you're doing uh, very good, then you're going to be penalized, right? Like and when you're doing yeah. poorly, you would be, you know, uh, at an advantage. So, so it's like this basic idea of like makes sense as a mechanism for maintaining diversity. What it's interesting here is not only that there is this, this kind of kicking back, but that there really like is a, some sort of stable equilibrium. Because I could think of that leading to say cycles or chaos or other things. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, are there any other questions? Yes. Uh, Leonardo. Yes, yeah, yeah, great talk, Stefano. I was thinking about if you only have two patches and inside uh, these patches you have some kind of uh, Locta Volterra um, competition model and the results are most likely the results that you have with that because if you have uh, interspecific competition is bigger, you will have more stable results. So there might be there is a sort of analogy with that kind of model that could be useful or not. I don't know, but it could be yeah, interesting think, also to. Yeah, I think in terms, right, like, you you can write models, for example, where we have competition within patches and then we have migration between patches. They turn out to have a very similar form as well as like the consumer resource model. They turn out to have a very similar structural form of the equations to the ones that we're, we're, we're trying here. So there's definitely is some sort of hidden connection between these different problems. Yeah, yeah like uh, I looked at the literature to try to find this, uh, uh, this <laughs> the output of function, right, that, that, that escaped me for so long. Uh, and in the end, I gave up, right? So in the end, I decided to to substitute divine you know, intervention for, for like labor uh, and just like augment the system and, and try to go that way. But, but I think you're right that there is definitely some model that would map directly into each other. Because there is some work about uh, invasion rates. If you take two pages, mm -hmm. maybe I, I saw that, but well, I don't know if you can get something but with that is interesting in terms of community ecology because if you have uh, different kinds of interactions in the local patches well maybe it's different what we have as a result you have you can have predation or cooperations yeah yeah i think that that's that's all fair game what, what is kind of interesting is that uh, adding these extra empty patches for example in the case of like rock paper scissor right there, if we had like species directly interacting with each other, so we have a certain number of like spots, and then you know species B comes and kicks species A out directly, and it colonizes. What we have mm -hmm. is like the same equilibrium, but we have mutually stable dynamics. And as we found for the case of higher order interactions, this fact that you go first to an empty patch and then you get colonized again creates this sort of separation you know, time scales that destabilize. So, so that I think it's kind yeah. of interesting that sometimes maybe we're focusing on direct interactions while we could add this extra step and have completely different dynamics. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, let me know if there are other people who would like to ask questions. Can I ask a question? <laughs> Go for uh, it. But the, the question I would like to ask is, you know, I've never seen this model before, but it's also true that I'm not really an expert in metapopulation. So if anybody has seen these type of models uh, uh, before or something very close, like in SIS or other literature, I, I would love to hear from you. No. No. Uh, no. no. Me either. Yeah, well, I have been watching this kind of models a long time, but I, I don't see any results that could be useful. But yeah, so I can't contribute. <laughs> okay. 
it's also difficult to see that two models are in fact the same model, right? Like the, the, there's so many ways to write the same. For the multi-strain models, uh, it would be interesting to see for some of the simplifications that were solved, whether they would map. And, uh, and then the question that would be pending, I agree, I agree that the multidimensionality would, yeah, I mean, you would, sorry, the, the combinatorics would blow up at some point with history. But it is interesting because there are very interesting results on different dynamical regimes with the intensity, for example, of competition, of cross immunity. And so there is a question of whether some of the, the, the theory could generalize to understand those dynamical regimes, even with these assumptions of short memory and, and how, they, how they continue as you extend the memory. I think that would be valuable because, yeah. because then you wouldn't find it in general for any history, but you would know that those regimes have an explanation that could be found in simpler models. Yeah, and I would like to make an analogy here with the work of Van Meigen, right? So as I said, in this paper, they end up with the same solution as Askey and Novaskine. And this solution is basically found by saying, we uh, account for, for like, um, you know, the distance between patches, but, but then we assume that like the products of patches are basically the, the, the rates become independent, right? So, so you could have there the same issue, right? That you could write these dynamics exactly, but then what you would need is like two to the n states, which is exactly the same problem as like the, the memory of all the possible, uh, uh, you know, exposures. Or you can do uh, basically memory one model, right? Which is what they presented here. But they're like, they're saying, what if I account for like correlation between patches, but not triplets of patches, right? So I do a sort of a memory two model, right? And you should be able to better and better approximate the dynamics of the true model by using this approximation. So I think there is something to be said there, and it is true that it like blows up, but it's also true that it blows up as the binomial coefficient, right? So we have n, you know, like states right now, and then we would have plus n choose two, right? <laughs> to have all the pairs, and then et cetera. Yeah, the, so, there are moment, there are moment, uh, there is a paper with mo moment considerations of that sort in strain dynamics. It could be interesting to see if it, Right, so, so you could say that, like, and after that, I have a, some sort of like average memory uh, uh, once I track like one and two or, or, or something like this. Mm, yeah, I haven't awesome. got there yet, Mercedes. Yes. Hi, hi, Bob, Bob Holt here. V very nice talk. Uh, Thank you. I, I do remember some papers that have to do with ecological memory that uh, might be worth uh, revisiting. And this is when people were looking at ecosystem engineering effects. So you think of beaver that colonize a stretch of stream, and then they modify that stream to make it suitable for them, but then the stream fills up because it's, you know, because of silt, and then it's unsuitable for a while, but then that unsuitability decays away. So there's a kind of ecological memory there. And uh, right. Gurney, you know, uh, Gurney and Nisbet did a paper with John Lawton, a very simple model with just three states to the patches, but it leads to strongly unstable dynamics depending on the the lag in the recovery state of the of the patch of the ecosystem. So, uh, you know, it's a, it's different from what you're talking about, but it's it's reminiscent. And one thing that struck me is that in the examples you were showing, you don't really get on you get transient unstable dynamics, but it seemed to settle down to a nice stable equilibrium in the long run most of the time. Um, yeah. So that's that's one yeah, arena that's where good. there might be some some interesting connections. I think. That's exactly what they need. Thank you, Bob. <laughs> I'll send you some references too, okay? So. Please, thank you. Any more questions? Uh, you, I am, you, do you hear me? Yes. Uh, yes. This paper about the role of memory in ecological systems, uh, do you know it's Henry and MacLeod, 1985? Okay. <laughs> it's interesting, I think. Uh, I, 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 I was looking. I, I remember I have something, but it's very old. <laughs> Memory in ecosystem. Uh, yeah. So uh, yes, it could be interesting, maybe, because 
Yeah. It's a cellular automaton, but they made some, yeah, they had some results. I should, you should look at it. Uh, sure. it's, if I have the... Yeah, please do send the reference. Thank you. Yeah, I will pass it here. Thank you. Yes, any other takers? Well, if not, if yes, then please interrupt. But if not, then thank you very much again, Stefano, for this fantastic talk. Uh, it's going to go online very soon. And also, do not forget that I believe in two weeks, but Geza will correct yes. me if I'm wrong. Two weeks, we will have another seminar by another of Sheer. Yes, exactly. And this will be the last seminar in this uh, semester. And the restart is uh, in uh, January 12th. But the two weeks from no SAP, yes. uh, Nadasha uh, Schnell, yes. Yes. Uh, by the way, uh, the uh, reference is in the chat yeah, now. Yeah, I uh, and slash anyone take it. Yeah, so thank you very much. So again, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you again, thank Stefano. You. And we will all see you uh, in two weeks. Happy Thanksgiving. So thank, thank, you. You. thank you. Happy Thanksgiving. Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye. Bye. Bye, Bye everyone. Bye.